Okay, lesson two of week three. And what did we learn yesterday? So we learned yesterday that Abigail Williams is a selfish, cruel and manipulative girl. So manipulative, for those who aren't sure, it means that she is able to say things and organise things so that people do what she wants them to do. And as you will see, as we go through the rest of the play, she is a master at manipulating people and situations. OK, so she was the one who organised going into the woods with Tichuba, and she is now desperately trying to stop the rumours of witchcraft in Salem. Even just dancing in the woods, which uh, Reverend Paris knows they were doing, would have been punished in a Puritan village by being whipped. But if it is decided or found out that they were conjuring spirits, the girls and teacher but it could actually be hanged because that was the punishment um, for being um, involved in witchcraft or being a witch in 1692. So Abigail needs Betty and Ruth to wake up properly so that the witchcraft rumours will disappear and then she will be safe. Before we read the next bit of text, um, it will make more sense to you if I do a bit of a spoiler um, for you on the plot. Uh, OK, so um, Abigail is a girl of 17 who works for the uh, Proctors and Proctor and his wife have three children. Now, then Proctor's wife was um, ill uh, about eight or nine months ago. And during that illness, Proctor slept with Abigail Williams. Now, obviously, it's completely unacceptable for a husband um, to um, to be um, having physical relationships with somebody who isn't their wife. And when you then add to that that this is a Puritan society, and remember all the rules that a Puritan society um, had in place. You couldn't do this, you couldn't do that, you couldn't kiss your wife in public, um, you couldn't um, eat food on Christmas Day. He would probably have been thrown out of the village for such an act. So we need to understand that um, this was a one-off event for Proctor. And he is thoroughly ashamed of himself. He believes himself to be the most guilty partner because um, he is older and should be wiser. And he completely betrayed his wife. And Abigail was only 16 at the time and therefore uh, younger than him and not as in control of herself. So Proctor, whilst he... Um, He's ne would never uh, sleep with Abigail again. He doesn't blame her as such. He only blames himself and sees himself as a sinner, as a bad man. So in the scene that I'm about to read to you, we see Abigail and Proctor together for the first time. And there's a lot of tension between the two of them because Abigail says that she loves him and she... Um, she wants to uh, be physical with him again, but Proctor is very, very clear here that is never going to happen again. OK, so it's a bit of a spoiler uh, going on there. Um, but uh, uh, you need that information to properly understand the scene that I'm about to read through with you. OK. So it's quite a lot we're reading today. You've got three slides of text, which I'm going to read through and uh, keep heading towards my um, my winning of an Oscar for my excellent performances. OK, I hope you enjoy it. OK, so.
Uh, I'm just going home, uh, Mr Proctor. Be you foolish, Mary Warren, be you deaf. I forbid you leave the house, did I not? What shall I pay you? I am looking for you more often than my cows. I only come to see the great doings in the world. I'll show you a great doing on your arse one of these days. Now get you home. My wife is waiting with your work. I'd best be off. I have my Ruth to watch. Good morning, Mr Proctor. Mercy sidles out. Since Proctor's entrance, Abigail has stood as though on tiptoe, absorbing his presence wide-eyed. He glances at her, then goes to Betty on the bed. <gasps> Gah! I'd almost forgot how strong you are, John Proctor. What's this mischief then? This mischief here? Oh, she's she's only gone silly somehow. The road past my house is a pilgrimage to Salem all morning. The town's mumbling witchcraft. Oh, posh. We were dancing in the woods last night and my uncle leapt in on us. She took fright is all. Ah, <laughs> you're wicked yet, aren't you? You'll be clapped in stocks before you're twenty. He takes a step to go and she springs into his path. Oh, give me a word, John, a soft word. Her concentrated desire destroys his smile. No, no, Abby, that's done with. You come five mile to see a silly girl fly? I know you better. I come to see what mischief your uncle's brewing now. Put it out of mind, Abby. Grasping his hand before he can release her. But John, I am waiting for you every night. Abby, I never give you hope to wait for me. I have something better than hope, I think. Abby, you'll put it out of mind. I'll not be coming for you more. You're surely sporting with me. You know me better. I know how you clutched my back behind your house and sweated like a stallion whenever I come near. Or did I dream that? It's she who put me out. You cannot pretend it were you. I saw your face when she put me out and you loved me then. And you do now. Abby, that's a wild thing to say. A wild thing may say wild things, but not so wild, I think. I have seen you since she put me out. I have seen you nights. I've hardly stepped off my farm this seven months. I have a sense for heat, John. And yours has drawn me to my window and I have seen you looking up, burning in your loneliness. Do you tell me you've never looked up at my window? I may have looked up. And you must. You are no wintry man. I know you, John. I know you. Oh, I cannot sleep for dreaming. I cannot dream but awake and walk about the house as though I'd find you coming through some door. She clutches him desperately, gently pressing her from him with great sympathy but firmly. Child, how do you call me child? Abby, I, I, I may think of you softly from time to time, but I will cut off my hand before I'll ever reach for you again. Wipe it out of mind. We never touched, Abby. Aye, but we did. Aye, but we did not. <laughs> oh, I marvel how such a strong man may let such a sickly wife be. <gasps> You'll speak nothing of Elizabeth.
She is blackening my name in the village. She is telling lies about me. She is a cold, snivelling woman and you bend to her. Let her turn you like her. Do you look for a whipping? I look for John Proctor that took me from my sleep and put knowledge in my heart. I never knew what pretense Salem was. I never knew the lying lessons I was being taught by all those Christian women and their covenanted men. And now you bid me tear the light out of my eyes. I will not. I cannot. You loved me, John Proctor, and whatever sin it is, you love me yet. John, pity me. Pity me. Downstairs, the words going up to Jesus are heard in the psalm and Betty claps her ears suddenly and whines loudly. Betty? She hurries to Betty, who is now sitting up and screaming. Proctor goes to Betty as Abigail is trying to pull her hands down, calling Betty, Betty, Betty. What's she doing? Girl, what ails you? Stop that wailing. The singing has stopped in the midst of this and now Paris rushes in. What happened? What are you doing to her? Betty? He rushes to the bed crying, Betty, Betty. Mrs Putnam enters feverish with curiosity and with her Thomas Putnam and Mercy Lewis. Paris at the bed keeps lightly slapping Betty's face while she moans and tries to get up. She, she heard you singing and suddenly she's, she's up and screaming. The psalm, the psalm, she cannot bear to hear the Lord's name. No, God forbid. Mercy, run to the doctor. Tell him what's happened here. Ha, mark it for a sign. Mark it. Rebecca Nurse, 72, enters. She's white haired, leaning upon her walking stick. Putnam, pointing at Betty. That is a notorious sign of witchcraft afoot, goody nurse. A prodigious sign. <gasps> My mother told me that when they cannot bear to hear the name of Rebecca. Rebecca, go to her. We're lost. She suddenly cannot bear to hear the Lord's. Giles Corey, 83, enters. He is knotted with muscle, canny, inquisitive and still powerful. There is a hard sickness here, Giles Corey, so please to keep the quiet. Well, I've not said a word. No one here can testify I've said a word. Is she going to fly again? I hear she flies. Man, be quiet now. Everything is quiet. Rebecca walks across the room to the bed. Gentleness exudes from her. Betty is quietly whimpering, eyes shut. Rebecca simply stands over the child, who gradually quietens. Okay, so we need to keep checking. We know who's who, uh, important things that each of the characters say and uh, making sure we know all the important bits about the main characters. So uh, I have created a table for you here, please, which I would like you to recreate in your exercise books, on paper, on your OneNote, whatever, wherever you're doing your work. Um, if you're writing in a book, put the title, what do we know so far? Create this table for me. Pause me while you're doing it. And when you have drawn your table, get back to me. OK, we probably need to leave a few lines for each character because hopefully um, if you've been following all the videos, you actually know quite a lot about each of these characters already. OK, draw your table. And get back to me. OK, so I've given you six characters to focus on. I want you to uh, see if you can find a quote for each of them. OK, it doesn't matter what quote it is. What's important is that by trying to find that quote, you'll be looking back through some of the text uh, from today's lesson, <clears throat> from yesterday's lesson and uh, from some of the lessons last week. Uh, OK, you don't need to fill all of this table in together. 
um, you can fill the quote sections in, certainly for Abigail and for John Proctor today, because that's uh, on, on the lesson, that's the bit that we've just read. OK, so. More importantly, what do you know so far? So from all the lessons that we've completed so far, what can you remember as important information about each of these characters? So Reverend Paris, Abigail Williams, Tichiba, Thomas Putnam, Betty and John Proctor. And I'd like you to see if you can get perhaps three or four things about each of those characters that you know. Uh, what motivates them, how they feel, things they did before the play started, things that you've read about them doing since the play started, attitudes that they have towards themselves or towards other characters. OK, so um, that's your task for the rest of this lesson. If that's done properly, I think that's going to take you about 20 minutes, 25 minutes to do. OK, so which which fills up your time for the rest of this lesson. To be helpful, because I'm a lovely person, I have put a completed table right at the end of this PowerPoint. Now, you can, of course, go straight to it and cheat or you can spend that time, 15, 20 minutes, completing this table to the best of your ability and then go forward and have a look at the table that I've completed for you. Now, hopefully some of the things that you've written down independently on your own and have some confidence in yourself, people. I think I think you actually know quite a lot. So some of the things you've written down may be exactly the same as what I've done and you have nothing to add or you may have been a bit stuck on some of the characters and you may find some pieces of information that you think are quite important that you then add to your table. OK, I'll leave that up to you. As teachers, we'd rather you had a go yourself. And then have a look at the end of the PowerPoint. Um, because that's how the best learning will take place. OK, that's it for lesson two, folks. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.